Hello everybody, hello, welcome back to my vlog. And this week on my vlog, we're going to be doing a book review. And the book that we're going to be looking at is this. It's Running by Ronnie O'Sullivan. And I've selected this book for two reasons. Firstly, Running wasn't, hasn't actually been recently published. Running was published back in 2013. And I did a written review of this book. Um, back then and even now uh, almost two years later it remains one of the most read posts on my site every month this article on my review of running is in the top five posts read and the second reason and I suspect it's linked to the first is the subject matter of running Ronnie O'Sullivan uh, suffers with a depression that is caused by his battles with perfectionism and as we know perfectionism and depression are two sides of the same coin and in running Ronnie talks very openly about how this battle has caused so much destruction in his life and the kind of strategies he's building around that. And given the current focus in, in culture and society today around mental illness and the work we can do, I think Ronnie's frankness and honesty are really important in, in being part of this discussion. I think it'd be really interesting if we went through this. I'm going to assume most of you know who Ronnie O'Sullivan is, uh, but for those of you who don't, uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan is considered to be, without question, the most talented snooker player that's ever existed, ever walked on the planet, ever picked up a cue. I don't think there's anyone left who disagrees with that. Um, I would even go so far as I think Ronnie O'Sullivan is currently today the most talented sports person on the planet. And I say that having seen Roger Federer play dozens of times, and I know how many people feel about Rory McIlroy. But I do think that Ronnie playing snooker is witnessing a profound talent that you just can't see anywhere else. Um, he's won everything. He's won five world titles, five UK championships. He has, I think it's 27 ranking titles. He has the most number of century breaks from any player ever. He has the most maximums from any snooker player ever. What, what's interesting about all of those statistics is they are not um, enough for many people to be, con for Ronnie to be considered the greatest player ever, full stop. And the reason for that is there are a couple of players who have more world championships than him, most notably Stephen Hendry on seven world titles as opposed to Ronnie's five. And there is a, a, a form of thinking for some people that Ronnie cannot be considered the greatest ever until he has at least matched Stephen Hendry. I find this quite a difficult concept. Um, my sporting hero, for example, is Ayrton Senna. Ayrton Senna has three, <coughs> four world championships, one of which, of course, he was denied by Alan Prost, but we'll talk about that another day. But obviously, this is nothing compared to Shumi Seven. And so for a lot of people, Senna isn't considered the greatest ever, but for me, it's just a no-brainer. And I feel the same about Ronnie O'Sullivan. But what I think is most interesting about Ronnie O'Sullivan's battles is people can hold it against him that he hasn't got seven world titles. But as we go through this book, as we realise the destructive, destructive battles Ronnie has had with his own depression, what actually then comes for me is the other way around, is we should be in awe of the fact that this guy has won as much as he has, considering what he has had to battle with to get there. So that's what we're going to look at today. Okay, so considering how talented Ronnie is, it's probably no surprise that his perfectionism comes with uh, depression as well. The two are ha come hand in hand and they're no exception here with Ronnie. What's interesting about running is how honest he is about how crippling he finds sometimes dealing with the talent that he has and how his battles with himself are often more profound than any battle with any opponent. Um, as Ronnie talks about in running is how crucial it is for him not just to win but to perform as he says here people often often don't believe me when i say it's how i play that's so much more important than whether or not i win and what i win but it's a hundred percent true and i don't doubt ronnie when he says that um the problem is is when you are so talented as he is is how sometimes that talent can be elusive like a muse and how chasing that can cause uh, enough problems and unless that's, ma unless that's managed well, which is of course what has happened with Ronnie. Um, but what's interesting is how he talks about this and this is some of the language he uses to describe his battle with perfectionism, uh, which is incredibly sad um, because he would talk about how in some ways I wish I was shit because then I wouldn't notice all my faults. 
and he hasn't got any faults. The problem is, it's just he's not forgiving when he doesn't play snooker that's perfecting. And when he doesn't play snooker that's perfect, bad things can start to happen in his mind. And that's when he starts getting into this terrible spiral of negative thoughts where he just wants to run away, his flight mode. Um, and of course the most famous demonstration of his flight mode was in 2006 when he walked out on Stephen Hendry. Um, and one of the challenges I found at that time was how he got so little sympathy from the people in World Snooker and from the commentators at the time. Uh, one of the frustrations is, is you want people to really understand how it is uh, for people with depression and mental illness and the struggle they go through just to get through the day. So it is frustrating when, as Ronnie puts here, most of the pundits thought I was a disgrace to the game and had brought shame on snooker around this incident where he walked out. And that's the kind of immediate knee-jerk, very ignorant response you're going to get when in fact, of course, you're desperately hoping for a far more sympathetic understanding. Um, but the hardest thing for Ronnie is um, when other players talk about Ronnie and you can actually see it in them is they are in awe of the man. They are the guy Ronnie has an incredible presence, has a huge charisma as well as his profound talent. He's a bit of a bit of a rock and roll star when it comes to snooker and so he has the crowd on his side, huge support um, and everyone waiting for the drama both off this off the table and on it um, and this affects other players uh, but what's interesting is you'd think Ronnie would be a cocky little individual with that and sometimes he certainly can come across as that but actually in his memoir in his writing you realize he has an incredibly low opinion of himself so just as an example as I said the other players are in awe of him across the board. They all think he's a genius and they're all slightly terrified that their game doesn't match up to his. This is what Ronnie thinks the other players must be thinking of him. At times I often felt I was past my sell by date. This was a new era of players and I was deluding myself. I questioned the type of game I was playing and whether it was equipped to deal with the new generation. I told myself that even though I thought I was playing an aggressive game, the new players were looking at me thinking, who is this old codger? Perhaps it was like me playing Terry Griffiths 20 years ago. He'd so rarely take a risk. And maybe they were looking at me in the same light going, this Ronnie O'Sullivan, he's a bit negative for me. He don't fancy the job. I was getting paranoid. I think unequivocally that is paranoia because every player out there wants to play like Ronnie O'Sullivan um, and they can't. And what's interesting is that Ronnie, rather than taking strength from that, is in fear of that. Uh, and it grips him, this fact that he, he can't play like that and how other players must judge him so adversely when he doesn't. Um, and indeed, even the audience too, as Ronnie says, they've, the audience, have come to see me play and if I've given them 10, 15 minute frames, I feel shit and want to go home and kill myself. And this is the kind of way that the most talented and probably the greatest snooker player ever thinks about himself and his game. It's an extraordinary language. Um, and one, even though the negative thoughts are not unfamiliar to people who have mental illness or depression or who have perfectionism, um, the fact that he's got to go out there and battle with that kind of frame of mind and win with that frame of mind is extraordinary. Uh, so. Running then investigates the solutions that Ronnie looks at uh, to try and deal with this. So when Ronnie was calling his memoir Running, it was obviously a title that works on many levels. But the most obvious level is the literal one, which is that Ronnie is hooked on running. Um, I suspect that's a lot to do with the serotonin release that comes into his head, and Ronnie's pretty open about that. Um, but his... It is an addiction he has to running, this compulsion, this needs he has to run all the time. And it's interesting as you read running how it's clear he has swapped one addiction for another. So out with the drinks and drugs and in with the running. And it is compulsive running all the time. Um, and um, I think Ronnie is aware of that when he even says um, that he'd established ages ago that he had an addictive personality um, and that he tends to pursue things to the end and as Ronnie says now it's just about trying to make the addictions healthy ones 
I think most psychologists, psychiatrists would be slightly concerned that you're just repeating a pattern. Um, but it's certainly interesting that Ronnie is at least aware of the fact that he has this cycle of addiction, that it's something he has to be managed rather than anything that could possibly be cured. Uh, Ronnie runs compulsively all the time and he opens each one of his chapters with a, a bit like Russell Crowe's tweets about how much he's been running or training or lifting that day, which is pretty funny. Uh, but what's interesting is though he started running maybe seven, eight years ago, it's pretty clear that even running, though it helps, couldn't be the cure that he was looking for. Because even after he started running, the battles that he had with his perfectionism weren't going away. They, he couldn't outrun those issues. Um, and he talks about still the pressure that he had at that time. So I think it was in 2006 when he walked out on Stephen Hendry in the match because he just couldn't cope with being there. Um, and I think it's in 2005 when he shaved his head at the World Championships because he just, uh, he just thought that was a good idea because he'd seen himself on telly the night before and thought he looked crap so he had his head shaved. And I think everyone was like, crikey, uh, this guy isn't in a good place. Um, and he wasn't. And there is one very, these were very two very public events uh, that we, everyone saw and realised very quickly that there was something wrong. But there's also another quite sad uh, reference in running where he talks about how he was at the China Open in 2010 and how he was in his hotel room crying, just not wanting to be there, uh, struggling with events in his personal life and desperately wanting to go home. Um, and you just think, get on a plane and go home. But he couldn't, and his manager at the time made him go out and play the next day. And you sort of think, God, this is eye-watering cruelty here, Ronnie. You shouldn't be surrounding yourself with people who don't quite understand that you should not be putting yourself under this kind of pressure. Um, so, running was a help, but it wasn't a cure. And in a search for the next stage, where running goes on to is Ronnie meeting up with a sports psychiatrist called Steve Peters. Okay, so for anyone who follows Ronnie O'Sullivan, you'll be pretty familiar with the name Dr. Steve Peters. And the work that Ronnie has done with the sports psychiatrist, uh, Steve Peters, uh, constitute a large part of running. And it's quite interesting because Steve, uh, Ronnie met Steve, I think about 2010, 2011, when Steve was working with British Cycling ahead of the 2012 Olympics. He was working with people such as Bradley Wiggins, Chris Hoy, and Victoria Pendleton um, on getting themselves psychologically prepared for competitive matches, competitive races. Um, and on meeting Ronnie, uh, Steve obviously thought he could do great work with him. Um, although it's pretty interesting in the book, the book was published in 2013, and Ronnie refers to how at that time now, uh, Steve was working with Liverpool Football Club and in particular Luis Suarez. So that went well. Um, I guess we all have limits to our talents. But with Ronnie, Steve has worked wonders and the approach, uh, the explanation that Steve was working on with Ronnie, he talks about in running, which is the chimp which is how that panic mode that sets in, that Ronnie beats himself with, uh, is actually the part of his brain that's in fight or flight, i.e. Ronnie is in flight mode as opposed to fight. So Ronnie panics, spirals, and wants to run out of the situation that he's in. And what um, Steve wanted to do is to work on controlling the chimp so that Ronnie could intervene and break the spiral of negative thoughts that happens. So as part of this, he asked Ronnie to keep a diary of his negative thoughts of the chimp and to talk about, to write down what is going through Ronnie's mind when he beats the crap out of himself. And Ronnie shares some of those diary entries in running. And I think they're pretty interesting to give you an idea of just what was going through Ronnie's mind and what still goes through Ronnie's mind when he's practicing and when he's playing. So here's a couple of examples. And Ronnie says, my natural thought process was, you hit a bad shot, you're shit. Your queuing's crap, you can't hit the ball, you're going to get beat, boom. And another example is, um, Ronnie in May 2012 had won the world championship, but this wasn't even enough to stop his chimp then. Because as Ronnie writes, by the beginning of the next season, the chimp was back, tapping me on the shoulder or staring me in the face, telling me I was shite. And this, this cycle of negative thoughts, this vicious battle with a profoundly low self-esteem um, is not unfamiliar territory to people with depression. Uh, what's interesting for me though is that this is 
not just a professional sportsman, but Ronnie O'Sullivan is an elite sportsman. And with this psychology, Ronnie's got to go out and he's got to compete and compete and win. So all the pressure that he's beating up on himself, he's got to pick himself up off the floor and send himself back out there and fighting. So where do these negative automatic thoughts come from? Uh, one of the rationales that you go through as you interrogate yourself, um, and as Ronnie does here, is trying to work out where he learnt this, where he learnt to beat the crap out of himself like this. Um, and I wonder whether Ronnie realises where those negativity comes from, where that comes from. But as you read running, you realise a lot of it may actually come from his father, the man that Ronnie credits with giving him that discipline and that focus in the early part of his career. Um, Ronnie talks about how his father was incredibly critical of him. And even when he came out of prison recently, Ronnie talks about how he began to get a bit more aware of how critical his dad could be of him. Um, and this is stuff that his, his dad was saying to him only recently. You'll always be a mess. You'll always have money problems. You'll always have this. You'll always have that. And as Ronnie says, I could have told him I'm a multiple world champion. I couldn't have made that much of a mess of my life. Um, but obviously, this was a way that Ronnie's father was using to encourage Ronnie at an early stage. And maybe when Ronnie's dad left, Ronnie's automatic thoughts took on that responsibility, took on that role and took that um, negativity into his own head and that's what, how he ends up with this battle. Uh, but what's interesting about all of this is even though Ronnie still struggles with this, he's at, at least able to identify it and identify his automatic thoughts and his negativity, uh, which is one of the critical parts of dealing with depression and I think that's a really interesting part of running. Of course, Given this is a memoir of a famous personality, uh, it isn't all about mental illness, depression, perfectionism. There is a lot of sort of gossipy parts to it that I suppose help sell the book. Um, Ronnie talks a lot about uh, how he got caught up in Ronnie Wood's battles with addiction. Ronnie is friends with Ronnie Wood and um, was pretty much involved in a when Ronnie Wood was having trouble to get on the Rolling Stones tour because he too was having his own battles with alcohol and how Ronnie was part of the intervention there. He's also very good friends with the artist Damien Hirst and Ronnie uh, talked about how he was with Damien Hirst on the day in 2008 when Damien Hirst was having a, a quite innovative uh, art sale where he went direct through Sotheby's uh, rather than go through a gallery and his whole collection sold for over a hundred million dollars I think that day. Um, but Ronnie also talks about some specifics in snooker. He talks about match fixing, he talks about Stephen Lee as he got caught out for match fixing and uh, John Higgins was caught up in a newspaper sting. Uh, Ronnie also talks about how he too was approached for match fixing. Uh, I remember that incident was quite difficult, troublesome when this book got published because Ronnie hadn't told World Snooker I think that he had been approached about match fixing and I don't think World Snooker were particularly impressed to hear about it for the first time in Ronnie's autobiography. Um, but what's also uh, fascinating about this is how much that reveals about Ronnie's psychology because he also talks about other players, he talks about his opinion on Ding Jun Wee, talks about Mark Selby and he talks about how uh, what he thinks of some of the other players on the tour. And Ronnie has a tendency to do this, and you do wonder sometimes whether Ronnie has a filter, uh, where the people are around Ronnie that are sort of going, don't do this, don't be so honest. Because in comparison with other sports people, you just wouldn't get Roger Federer writing what he thinks about all the other players on the tour in a book quite like this. Um, and you certainly wouldn't get it from, I can't think of any other elite sportsman that would do a memoir while still on the tour, still part of the game and just completely tick them off with their opinions on each player. You just wouldn't get that. And you do sort of wonder, although that filter has helped us, like that lack of filter has helped us when chatting about Ronnie's battles with depression, you just sort of think, ah, please, please don't do this. You shouldn't be doing this. Uh, but yeah, so there's all that as part of the book as well for, for people to get excited about. And as well as the gossip, there's also parts of this book that don't sit that well with me. Um, Ronnie has a tendency to use quite sexist language when talking about women. There's a constant reference to birds. 
Ronnie refers to his current fiance Layla as a good girl um, and he has very very sexist views towards uh, gender responsibilities and relationships particularly bringing up children um, and one of um, the challenges I had it was trying to read through this and try and be a bit more forgiving because under, under any other circumstances I would give Ronnie a hell of a time for using some of the language that he did so why aren't I now you get the feeling when reading Ronnie running that Ronnie isn't a bad person uh, that he is someone without an anchor that he has been someone who's been looking for a father figure for some guidance for a long time so you tend to be quite forgiving and quite tolerant about it uh, when he says things you get the impression he probably doesn't mean um, but also one of the things when we were talking about instrumental with James Rhodes is how that battle is never won so the same here for Ronnie so even though he does his running even though he does see Steve Peters he is still very honest about the fact that he is still battling with that and that all it is he can do is manage that and that there may never well be a cure and one of the interesting um, self-awareness uh, parts of running is Ronnie talks about how he often has paranoia and how that hasn't really faded. And one of the lines he, he uses here is, paranoia is a form of depression. Other people probably don't even notice it. You feel that everybody is enjoying themselves, having a good time, and inside I'm feeling so uncomfortable. I just want to be in my room on my own. And um, Ronnie talks about how he, even now he feels like so much of it, my life is running. Running from lawyers, agents, hangers-on, running from world snooker, even running from the family at times. I'm running from everything. And I think that's pretty much where I want to wrap it up because, um, as I've said before, uh, Ronnie is profoundly talent and he has honed that talent into a formidable weapon. He is a phenomenal sportsman and he is a phenomenal champion. And the fact that he can still talk about himself and his life in these terms and still go out there and compete and win and still be widely considered the best snooker player there is today, not just in talent but also one that you want to beat, we should be impressed that Ronnie has been as successful as he is rather than try and take him down with pointing out what he hasn't won because to go through life with this attitude to yourself and to your talent and to your skill and to still win uh, is incredibly impressive so definitely give running a read definitely just gloss over the sexism Okay, so next week the vlog is coming from the shoes exhibition at the V&A, so that'll be pretty exciting, so tune in next week for that one. Until then, have a great week and enjoy the sunshine, let's hope. <laughs>